Man, I freaking love like post twenty eight eighteen midterm America because the president calls Congressman Adam Shift Adam shit, and now we've got a Democrat literally threatening to nuke people that own guns. Like this is freaking hilarious stuff. That and if you post an NPC meme on Twitter, you're instantly kicked off for dehumanizing people. But you can continue to call people possible pedophiles, Nazis, gangbangers, etc., etc., and you're still allowed to be on there. And if you're Farrakhan, you can call people termites and that you want to eradicate them, and that's perfectly fine. But going back to the whole thing about nuking people, like that's freaking hilarious because last I checked on Twitter, they have that whole terms and condition thing where you can't actually go around and threaten to kill people. Like it's pretty freaking crazy. Let me go ahead and see if I can pull up that tweet. It was actually really funny. It's about a week old right now, but it's still pretty freaking perfect. I actually sent out something on Twitter saying, hey guys, isn't this, I don't know, like what gets people typically kicked off? Oh, okay. Here, here's the whole thing that started it. It was a, it was a tweet by Joe Biggs. He said, so basically at Rep Sortwell, Eric, Sw Eric Swalwell, so it was at Rep Swalwell wants a war because that's what you would get. You're out of your fucking mind if you think I'll give up my rights and give up the gov and give up all my rights to the government so they have all power. And he's responding to this initial tweet by uh, John Cordillo, who basically said, make no mistake, Democrats want to eradicate the Second Amendment, ban and seize all guns, and have all the power with the rest of the state. These people are dangerously obsessed with power. So how did Representative Swalwell respond to Joe Biggs? He said, it would be a short war, my friend. The government has nukes. Too many of them, but they're legit. I'm sure if we talked, we could find common ground to protect our families and community. Right there. Like, how can you, how, how can you move on past that? It's like, it's like he's trying to like downplay himself, then claim that he's the common sense person. He's like, well, it'd be a short war. The government has nukes. So he's basically saying, I'd just nuke you. But then he's like, oh, well, there are too many of them because he has to jump on the PC. Oh, we have to demilitarize and denuclearize everything. And then he's like, yeah, but they're, but they're still serious. Like, they'll, they'll actually still nuke you. And he's like, but I'm sure if we talked, we could find common ground. It's like, how can you find common ground with somebody that said, if you have a problem with us, we're going to go ahead and nuke you? Like, I don't know about you, but that's pretty crazy. And each time I've seen this, I've seen this when I've been tabling with uh, Gun Owners of America and other organizations, when people are like, oh, well, you know, it's really, the Second Amendment's really just for hunting. I'm like, no, it's for protection against an unstable, villainous state that wants to seize all control because it's supposed to be a check on government. And then you've got all these people that are like, yeah, but we could never go up against the government. We could never go up against that. I'm not here to really debate that issue. I've done that a million times. So one thing I do want to do is I want to jump into a little bit of U.S. history. So AmericanHeritage.com. It's called The Battle of Athens. I'm going to go ahead and read you this article, and I'll jump into some commentary in between. But this is absolutely hilarious. So I'm going to go ahead and start writing. I'm sorry, start reading. So The Battle of Athens. This article was written by Lone Cyber back in 1985. The GIs came home to find the political machine had taken over their Tennessee county. What they did about it astounded the nation. So here we go. And this is in uh, volume 36, issue 2 of the American Heritage magazine. In McKinnon County, Tennessee in the early 1940s, the question was not if you farmed, but where you farmed. Athens, the county seat, lay between Knoxville and Chattanooga along U.S. Highway 11, which wound its way through eastern Tennessee. This was the meeting place for farmers from all surrounding communities, traveling along the narrow roads planted with signs urging them to see Rock City and get right with God. They would gather on Saturdays beneath the courthouse elms to discuss politics and crops. There were barely 7,000 people in Athens. That kind of reminds me of my hometown in, uh, in Arizona, Sierra Vista. It went from like 7,000 to like 200,000 within a decade. But I digress. Uh, and many of its streets were still unpaved. The big cities, some 50 miles away, had not yet begun their inevitable expansion, and the farmers' lives were simple and essentially unaffected by what some would call the modern world. 
Some of them were without electricity. The land, their families, religion, politics, and war dominated their talk and thoughts. They learned about God from the family Bible and in the tiny chapels along yellow dust roads. Their newspaper, the Daily Post Athenian, told them something of politics and war, but since it chose to avoid intrigue or scandal, a story that smacked of both could be found in only conversations of the folks who milled in the courthouse lawn on Saturdays. Since the Civil War, political offices in McKinnon County had gone to the Republicans, but in the 1930s, Tennessee began to fall under the control of Democrat bosses. To the west, in Shelby County, E.H. Crump, the Memphis mayor who had been ousted during his term for failing to enforce prohibition, fathered what would become the state's most, most powerful political machine. Isn't it funny how when Democrats always come in, they try and come in with an iron fist? Funny. Crump eventually controlled most of Tennessee along the governor's office in the United States Senator. In eastern Tennessee, local and regional machines developed, which, lacking the sophistication and power of Crump, relied on intimidation and violence to control their constituents. Remind you of anybody right now? Food for thought. In 1936, the system descended upon McKinnon County in person uh, regarding one Paul Cantrell, the Democratic candidate for sheriff. Cantrell, who came from a family of money and influence in the nearby town, Etwa, tied his campaign closely to the popularity of the Roosevelt administration and rode the FDR coattails to victory over his Republican opponent. Fraud was suspected, but to this day, many Athens families firmly believe the ballot boxes were swapped. But there was no proof. Over the following months and years, however, those who questioned the election would see their suspicions vindicated. The laws of Tennessee provided an opportunity for the unscrumptious to prosper. The sheriff and his deputies received a fee for every person they booked, incarcerated, and released. Ah, policing for profit much? The more human transactions, the more money they got. A voucher signed by the sheriff was all that was needed to collect the money from the courthouse. Deputies routinely boarded buses, passing through and dragging sleepy-eyed passengers to jail to pay their $16.50 fine for drunkenness. That might seem like nothing today, but that was a lot back then in the post-depression America. Whether they were guilty or not, arrests ran as high as 115 per weekend. So remember, this is a town of maybe around 7,000 people, and you're booking about 115 people a week. That's a good chunk of the populace. The fee system was profitable, but, oh yeah, see, that's the whole policing for profit thing right there. And, uh, but record keeping was required and the money could be traced. It was less troublesome to collect kickbacks for allowing roadhouses to operate openly. Cooperative owners would point out influential patrons. They were not bothered, but the rest were subject to shakedowns, prostitution, liquor, and gambling which grew so prevalent that it became knowledge in Tennessee that Athens was wide open. So let, let me think about this. Uh, right now, Athens, 1940, Tennessee, run by Democrats with police who are profiting. Huh? Does that remind you of, I don't know, maybe Ferguson, Detroit, Chicago? I could probably keep going. Encouraged by his initial success, Cantrell began what would be a 10-year reign. In subsequent elections, ballot boxes were collected from the precincts, and the results t uh, tabulated in secret at McKinnon County Jail in Athens. Opposition poll watchers were labeled as troublemakers and ejected from precinct houses. In 1940, the election sent George Woods, a plump and affable Etwa crony of Cantrell, to the state legislature. Woods promptly, promptly introduced, and I quote, an act to redistrict McKinnon County, end quote. It reduced the number of voting precincts from 23 to 12 and cut down the number of justices of the peace from 14 to 7. Of these seven, four were openly Cantrell men. When Governor Prentice Cooper signed Wood's bill into law on, on February 15, 1941. Effective Republican opposition died in, McK in McMinn County. McMinn County Court, which was still dominated by Republicans, directed the county to purchase voting machines. 
Notice how Democrats always have a problem with voting machines. But anyway. The Cantrell Democrats countered by having Woods get a bill passed in Nashville, abolishing the court and then selling the machines to, quote, save the county money. Department of Justice records show investigations of electoral fraud in McMinn County in 1940, 1942, and 1944, all without resolution. During the Civil War, deep with in secessionist territory, McMinn County had sided with the Union. In, in 1898, she had declared war on Spain two weeks before Washington got around to it. How could Cantrell have such undisputed control over a county noted for its independent and cantankerous spirit? One lies in the Second World War. 3,526 young men, or about 10% of McMinn's population, went off to fight. Most of those left behind, older and perhaps more timid, contributed to the Cantrell machine's growth by remaining silent. Still, as the war dragged on, people began to tell each other, wait until the GIs get back. Things will be different. And for the record, you go ahead and look at the military and everything else. Most of them are typically always conservative. Well, that's another fact. In the summer of 1945, veterans began returning home. By 1946, the streets of Athens overflowed with uniforms. The Cantrell forces were not worried, though. Bill White, local resident, recalled coming home from overseas with mustering out paying in his pocket. That's a weird term. Mustering out pay. Oh, yeah, mustering out pay in his pocket. So he was getting out, and he got a whole bunch of money for getting out after the war. Uh, there were several beer joints and honky tonks around Athens. We were pretty wild. We started having trouble with the law enforcement at the time because they started making a habit of picking up GIs and then fitting them heavily for most anything. That's a term for basically saying they shook them down for everything they got. They were making, they, they were kind of making a racket out of it. So you have the GIs coming back. They've got a lot of money. They're having fun. They're a little bit wild. And the cops are trying to find every reason to go ahead and extort them for something. Uh, White continues... After long years of service, most of us were hardcore veterans of World War II. We were used to drinking our liquor and our beer without being molested. Oh, I love this guy's use of words. When these things happened, the GIs got madder. The more GIs they arrested, the more they beat up, the madder we got. At last, the veterans chose to use the most basic right of the, demo of the democracy for which they had gone to war, the right to vote. In the early months of 1946, they decided in secret meetings to field a slate of their own candidates for the August elections. In May, they formed a nonpartisan political party. As the election approached, there were few overt signs of impending trouble. Although, to the citizens of McMinn County, it was apparent that something had, had to happen. There was too much at stake on both sides. The Daily Post-Athenian was characteristically silent. The most significant news item that appeared on the election eve, July 31st, 1946, at the bottom of page one, VFW members in the neighboring Blount County said that 450 veterans were ready to respond to any need in McMinn County. Above, this was, report, this, this was a report that Tony Pierce had killed a muskrat in his front yard. The veterans fielded candidates for five offices, but interested centered, but I'm sorry, but interest centered on the race for sheriff between Knox Henry, who had served in the North Africa campaign, and Paul Cantrell. So obviously you can tell that this isn't really going to work out for them. Since the 1936 election, Cantrell had gone on to the legislature as a state senator and installed Pat Mansfield nicely for himself during his term in office. His four years as sheriff had netted him an estimated $104,000. That's like, that's like a million bucks back then. My gosh. But now in 1946, Cantrell was running for sheriff and Mansfield for state senator. In the final weeks, a flurry of advertisements appeared in the Post-Athenian. Cantrell enumerated the accomplishments of the Democratic Party. Mansfield denied that two men arrested on July 30th with a shipment of liquor were deputies, even though they admitted that they had and were going to deliver election whiskey downtown, where merchants announced that all stores would be closed on election day to give employees a chance to vote. 
Although this had not been necessary in previous elections, Cantrell warned that the veterans had printed sample ballots with the intention of stuffing ballot boxes. The veterans offered $1,000 awards for verifiable information about election fraud and repeated a slogan that for weeks that had sounded again and again from their commounted loudspeaker, your vote will be counted as cast. So see, even back then, Democrats cheating as they typically do, committing voter fraud as they are so talentedly good at. Two days before the election, the GIs ran an advertisement in the Post-Athenian. These young men fought and won a war for a good government. They know what it takes and what it means to have a clean government. And they are energetic enough, honest enough, and intelligent enough to give us a good, clean government. A couple pages further on, the Democrats had their say. Look at all the facts. And you will vote for the Democratic ticket. The campaign fight is as old as the hills. It is a story of the outs wanting back in. Oh, that's, that's kind of that's harsh. Then again, Democrats have never necessarily shown much appreciation for America's veterans. I continue. The next day, the paper reported that veterans in Blount County had offered to come help watch polls. Mansfield began building an army of his own. It has come to my attention, he said, that certain elements intend to create a disturbance at and around the polls. In order to see that the law and order is maintained, I will have several hundred deputies patrolling the county. He hired all of them from outside the county, some from even out of state. They would crowd inside every voting precinct, and they would be armed. Eh, Voter suppression much? No, no, but the Democrats, though. Whatever. August 1st, 1946, Election Day found voters lined up early in the largest turnout in local history. Joining them were some 300 of Sheriff Mansfield's special deputies. Trouble began early, though. At 9.30 a.m., Walter Ellis, a legally appointed GI representative at the first precinct in the courthouse, was arrested and jailed for protesting irregularities. Sirens wailed throughout the morning, though, and police cruisers were seen speeding toward the jail. GIs began gathering on Washington Street outside L.L. Schaefer's jewelry store, which served as an office for their campaign manager, Jim Buttram who had seen action in North North Africa, Sicily, Italy, and Normandy. So this guy was one badass mother effer. Above the the door, a sign read, Phone 787 Jim Batram, the number to which voters were to report election fraud. Only after prolonged pounding did a harried Batram cautiously open the door to his comrades. As more than 200 GIs filled the small store, the somber mood of their leader told them they were in trouble. He showed them copies of two telegrams dated July 22nd. One he had addressed to Governor Jim McCord in Nashville, Tennessee, and the other to um, General Tom Clark, Washington, D.C. They requested assistance to ensure a fair election, neither of which had been answered. Otto Kennedy, an ex-GI himself, but a political advisor to the veterans, entered the office and announced that Cantrell had posted armed guards at each precinct. They all knew that this move was in preparation for 4 p.m. poll closings when the ballot boxes would be moved to the jail for counting. A small group of veterans demanded an armed mobilization and called for a leader. Batram declined, so did Kennedy, but he offered the rear of his... A Sankey garage and tire shop across the street as a meeting hall. Sorry, it took me a while to get that word. I was public schooled, forgive me. The group crossed the street, held a meeting, and agreed that those who did not have weapons should get them and return as quickly as possible. So, actually, it's funny, you read that. The question wasn't who did not own a weapon. The question was who did not have a weapon currently with them. By 3 p.m., most were back at the Asanke and most were armed. About this time, Tom Gillespie, an elderly black farmer from Union Road, stepped sorry, stepped inside the 11th Precinct's polling place in Athens. Okay, uh, Wendy Wise, a Cantrell guard, told Gillespie, and I'm not going to say this word, but he called him the N-word, you can't vote here. I uh, remember Democrats and their ever-loved Jim Crow laws. Remember, they created that. 
Uh, when Tom protested, why struck him with brass knuckles? What the hell is a cop doing with brass knuckles? Um, Gillespie dropped his ballot and ran for the door. Wise pulled a pistol and shot him in the back as he reached the sidewalk. Dang. Anyway, the first shot of the day brought crowds streaming up Jackson from the courthouse. Sheriff Mansfield's cruiser turned off College Street and screeched to a halt in front of the waterworks, and deputies loaded the bleeding Gillespie into the car. Mansfield ordered the precinct closed, posted four deputies outside to guard the waterworks, and then took Gillespie to jail. A dozen veterans from the Asanke started up. Jackson toured the waterworks. They were unarmed. During the confusion following the shooting, two GI poll watchers um, had been seized and held inside. Okay, I just want to go ahead and start. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip a little bit of this. Okay. At the strange movie theater across from the courthouse, the Marquis said, coming soon, gunning for vengeance. Yeah. Down. He, uh, he got caught at one point. And he says, you call yourselves GIs. You go over there and fight for three, four years, and you come back, and you let a bunch of draft dodgers who stayed here where it was safe, and you're making it safe for them push you around. If you people don't stop this, and now, in this time and place, you people wouldn't make a pimple on a fighting GI's ass. Go get your guns. So they start and get more guns. In the early evening, Bill White went to go get guns himself. He sent two GI's to get a truck and with a few other veterans, headed for the National Guard Armory. There, he said in a 1969 interview, he broke down the armory doors and took all the rifles. Oh my gosh. Okay, opinions differ on how exactly the challenge was issued. But they essentially say um, they went over to the court, to the jail, and started basically saying, "We're gonna come in if you don't actually count the votes accurately." The veterans were eager to eager to end the battle. At that point, they had been throwing dynamite at the jail. Some of them made Molotov cocktails. Uh, they made gasoline bombs. Uh, about this time, an ambulance pulled around the north side of the jail. Assuming it was for the evacuation of the wounded, the veterans let pass. Two men jumped in, but then, instead of returning to the hospital, the ambulance sped north out of town. The men were Paul Cantrell and Pat Mansfield. Uh, okay, so, long story short, they get in the jail. They beat people up. They get the ballots. At dawn, the veterans slipped from the jail, made their way through the... <laughs> through the streets and dispersed into what they had hoped would be anonymity. Miraculously, there had been no deaths that entire day. So let's go ahead and reemphasize this. No one died. But on an August 2nd, page 1 headline from the New York Times wrongly trumpeted the news, Tennessee sheriff and is slain in primary day violence. See? The lying fake news New York Times. Going and faking stuff all the way back then. All day, reporters with cameras and notebooks poured into town to photograph, question, analyze, and write. And every newcomer passed the sign on Highway 11. Welcome to Athens, the friendly city. So, essentially, they were able to go ahead and get a recount. They were able to go ahead and bring in nonpartisan people. And basically, without the Democrats, they wouldn't have... I mean, without the veterans, the Democrats would have just completely stolen the town government. Uh, years later, Pat Mansfield returned secretly to Athens on August 8, 1946, to resign his membership on the election committee. I mean, election commission. So this guy who was doing all this was even on the election commission. He met with Otto Kennedy for two hours, apparently with no ill feeling on either side, and then announced, I'm through with politics for good. I'll sure mess you up sometimes. I'm going back to railroading. Athens has not changed that much in 40 years. There's a new courthouse and an imposing structure that's too large for its site. But essentially, things kind of stayed the same. And the town went on and lived happily on through this day. So whenever the Democrats go ahead and say you can never take us on, just remember, sometimes, as Patrick Henry says, it takes a tired, angry, irate, tirated minority to go ahead and take on an unwilling, cowardice majority. Go ahead, be great.